Greetings. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior. Welcome you to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. Virginia Beach one. I'm Pastor Witt. Glad you came to worship God. I uh, hope you've had a good week. Hope you've taken care of your, uh, your obligations. And on top of that, you also taking care of obligations that God has placed on your heart. Today is the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, September 3rd. September, October, November, December. Wow. Four months until the end of the year. It's moving right along, isn't it? Beautiful weather tomorrow, which is Saturday, the day before this day, uh, that we're worshiping, September 3rd. Uh, it's supposed to be absolutely gorgeous. I hope you've taken advantage of this time of the year. It won't be long until it's gone, and uh, we're about to move into fall. Fall is my absolute favorite time of the year. The smell of the leaves. The... Anyway, again, glad you came to worship God. Thank you for your financial support. We've had some some nice gifts over the past couple of weeks of have helped to uh, to kick us back up. If you're running behind for the year, now will be the time to get a hold of it and to do what you need to do so that we can um, come into the fall full bore, ready to roll with everything that we need. Uh, if you're not giving to the Lord, I really want you to think about that. Think about why it is that you're not doing it. Thinking about, uh, ask God what it is that God wants you to do. Wants you to Where God wants you to put your money. I will remind you that the UMCOR, United Methodist Committee on Relief, right now is in need of some, some, some heavy funds to, to help folks south of us and far, far west of us from fires and, um, and hurricanes and floods and such. Uh, someone said to me the other day, you know, it just seems to me that we constantly have something that we're giving to. And I thought, yeah. And I said, well, it's interesting. God's constantly giving to us, isn't he? He said, spoken like a true preacher. I said, all right, fine. I'll take it. Do what it is that God motivates you to do. And if it's nothing, have a nice day. And um, may that be, not being flippant, I'm saying, you know, if God's not motivating you to do anything, have a nice day. But uh, I would say that if God's not motivating you to help anybody to, to, um, to do tithe or offerings or sacrifices, I would take a look seriously at my relationship with God because my relationship with God over the years has done nothing but cause me to want to help other people through the church, not through other organizations, through the church. So the folks will be called. Anyway, the, uh, the title of today's theme is, Who Am I? Who Am I? And uh, we're going to be looking at a couple very, very familiar passages. Um, I want to remind you that uh, starting not this Wednesday but next Wednesday uh, a week away we'll begin our Wednesday evening um, fellowships and uh, we will we will be wanting um, folks to come and to, to share in soup and salad and then study or if you're youth doing puppets or if your children uh, singing uh, there'll be a book club that meets once a month prior to all this. Information's online and uh, should, be, should be great fun. How about we begin our worship by taking a couple moments to center ourselves on Jesus. Let's do so.
Now hear the call to worship and invocation. Followers of Christ, God calls us just as we are to live with as truth tellers and gospel bringers to the world. God, we know you call us, and still we ask, who am I that you would call me? Like Moses standing before the burning bush, convinced of his unworthiness to lead your people out of bondage, we ask, who am I that you would call me? Like Peter, who thought he got it right only to realize that who Jesus is doesn't meet his expectations of who a Savior should be, we ask, Who am I that you would call me? As we raise this question to God today, we open our hearts to receive God's answer. You are my beloved children. You are my disciples. You are my people called to share the love of God for the transformation of the world. Amen. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name. Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray for illumination. Lord God, please open for us your written word. Holy Spirit, attach to these words and make them become living experiences for us so that we may hear a renewed word from you. Amen. This morning's first scripture reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping his flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, Further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. 
But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And he said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. This morning's second scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. The written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. Have you ever tried to think up of an excuse to get out of doing something? Maybe it was something that you should have already done, like a chore or your homework or practicing the piano or practicing your multiplication facts. Maybe you had promised to do something and you just forgot. Maybe you simply didn't want to do what you were asked to do. The story in the scripture this morning talks to us about God having a very important job for Moses. God had chosen Moses to lead the Hebrew people out of slavery, and Moses didn't want the job. He thought up so many excuses of reasons why he wasn't the right guy for this job, or why someone else could do it better than he. But for every excuse that Moses came up with, God promised to help to solve that problem. And after a while, Moses just ran out of excuses. God has important things for us to do as well. Can you name something important that we can do for God this week? Those are all excellent ideas. We can show others that we are Jesus followers, that we can show his love by caring about them and being nice to people who are maybe even different than we are. We can forgive someone who has hurt our feelings. We can be patient and we can be kind and we can give to others. So even when our brain is telling us the right thing to do, it's just easier to think up excuses. But God has an answer for every excuse we can make. And God will help us to do the right thing. When we listen and follow God's direction, we won't need excuses. Do you know what I'm holding in my hand? It's a mirror. And yes, you're right. A mirror reflects what we look like. So this week, when you look into a mirror, I want you to ask, God, what do you want me to do to show others your love? I encourage you not to make excuses, but rather to follow God's direction and do what's right in God's eyes. Let us pray. God, thank you for having such high expectations for me. Forgive me for the times when I think of reasons not to do what you want me to do. Help me to do what is right. Amen. I don't know about you, but uh, I don't ever read that scripture of Exodus and not see the Ten Commandments and Moses walking around in that stilted kind of a way, overacting way that he did. And yet as a one, you know, as a very young kid watching that movie, it, um, 
and impacted me, my faith system, my development. I want to talk about that a little bit today. I want to talk about this, this development. Um, I believe that we need to ask that same question. And I believe that it is one of the questions that we ask when we go to God. Who are you? Tell me your name. You know, an Old Testament understanding is that names, uh, that meaning is attached to names. Um, I happen to believe that. I happen to be one of the crazy people that thinks that what you're named or what you're called <coughs> has some, some bearings on who you become and who you are. Um, I got one buddy, Ron, that that has a bunch of names. Um, I call him Ron. I call him Pee Wee. I call him Mouse. Those two were little names that were attached to him when he was in the Navy. I call him Cheese Boy because he's from Wisconsin. Um, he got bit by a tick some uh, time ago, and and he wore teeth a, a shirt that. Um, that had a little saying on it, um, tick magnet. Uh, you know, I call him tick magnet. Um, I call him friend. I call him good person. I call him a really, really good human being, a lover of his wife, a lover of the church, a, a good friend, uh, a person who has helped a lot of people through their lives uh, through some very difficult things. Uh, Cheese Boy to me is, is really, really important. But I think names, I think names are, are really important. I was, I'm, I've been listening, I told you this last week, I've been listening to a podcast about Exodus. Um, and it's, it's really an extremely wonderful thing. And I was listening to, to, um, to one of the guys on there talking about the name of God. Um, and then I was speaking with somebody near here and, Apparently, in the Hebrew, um, the word for God is is. And that there is no I am inside of Hebrew. And so when it translates over to English, <coughs> we take is and turn it into I am. But is, that's a very interesting name. Um, I is. Or just, really, it's just is. Um, is. Who shall I tell them? Tell them is. I is who I is. Huh. Has your understanding of God changed over time? Mine has. I've done some reading this past week about that. Um, uh, I'm reading a book about... Um, spirituality and the development of the brain and what faith systems actually do to the formation of the brain and the wiring of the brain. Um, getting ready for a class in a few weeks. There is something about having a faith system, something, the, the, the writer of this book indicates that, and he's a neuroscientist that actually looks at brains um, with uh, magnets and stuff. And, um, There is a rewiring of the brain as we think about God. I find that interesting. There's a rewiring of the brain as we think about God. That we move from utilizing, as I was talking several weeks ago about that internal brain, the amygdala, and we begin to use the cortexes around the outside of our brain, the higher functioning part. He said, as we think about God, we begin more and more and more to move away from reptilian brain and move toward utilizing this, this outside cortex. Um, so, when Moses looks at this burning bush, which has always been a very interesting thing for me too. Um, I understand that in the desert, it's not a rare thing to see fires, to see burning bushes. Um, but it's an exceedingly rare thing to see bushes that burn that are not consumed, that the fire just simply is. I remember being in the Sinai Peninsula back many years ago and going to Catherine's Monastery, which is one of the supposed sites where Jesus saw, or where uh, Moses saw the burning bush. And, 
and there's an actual bush inside of Catherine's monastery that they say is the actual kind of bush that exists and there are fossils there um, I've told this story many times but it's just it's absolutely hilarious to me that in the midst of Catherine's monastery is this big giant bush I can't remember its botanical name but they say that it is the same kind of bush that that burned and was not consumed that Moses saw and, and right beside it is a huge fire extinguisher somebody had the funniest the funniest sense of humor to put a fire extinguisher beside that as though to say well if this thing catches on fire please put it out we don't want another message um, would you like to have a message from God or would you rather use the fire extinguisher some folks really seek after a message from God other people do all that they can to avoid hearing God as Moses approaches this bush, we, uh, we're told by the story that, that God begins to speak from the bush. Now, notice that we have two entities. It's an angel of the Lord that's burning the bush. And then the voice of God. I want you to do something for me. I want you to think about how many times um, there's a message from God that it's not the voice of God that's heard. Scratch your head on that one. You know, Jesus' baptism. Uh, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Um, up on the mountain of transfiguration. Shh, shh, stop talking. Listen, listen to him. He's my son with whom I'm well pleased. I find that interesting. That the voice of God is a voice that comes. And the voice says to Moses, hey, let's make this a, a, a place, a holy place here. Can we? Can we do that? Take your shoes off. Remove your shoes from your feet. Now that's an interesting thing to me. Remove your shoes from your feet. As though he had the shoes on his ears or something. But uh, remove the shoes from your feet. And um, don't come any closer. He says, you know, I've heard this cry of my people, and um, I've heard you guys saying that nobody's listening. I am listening. I've heard it. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you. And uh, one of my favorite all-time songs in the hymnal is, um, you know, this, this one that has this haunting sound to it. Whom shall I send? And then it breaks down into this next thing. Um, what if God asked you to go and do something? Would you do it? Moses is called upon to be the person that goes and to release the people. To, to talk with Pharaoh. Now I want to remind you that this can't be a comfortable place for Moses. Because Moses has fled from Egypt because he has killed an Egyptian. He has determined who he is. That he's not an Egyptian. That he's actually an Israelite. He has made the choice to not be the powerful, but to be of the lowly. He has made a choice to protect the lowly, the Israelite. The ones that are being beaten, the ones that are being killed, the ones that have been enslaved. He has chosen not to be of the people who are in power, but to be a part of the people who are oppressed. And now God is saying, not only, not only have you chosen to be a part of them, not only have you chosen to come see this burning bush, now know that I have chosen you to go back and do what your people want. Has God ever asked you to do something? Let me suggest to you that if you have had a relationship with God for a long period of time and God has never asked you to do anything, chances are He has, God has, and you have not listened. Because I don't know God to be in the business of not calling people to ministry. Let me talk a little bit more about that in a minute.
Moses then takes a different tack and he says to God, Who am I that I should, that I can, that I am willing to do this thing? I can tell you as a person who, who was called into the ministry, I asked that question. Who am I? In fact, what I reminded God was, do you not know who I am? Do you not know who I am, what I am? Do you not know my proclivities? Do you not know my, my bents, my ways of moving, my ways of thinking, my ways of being motivated in this world? To which God did not respond at all. God said, I call you to be a pastor. I ran from that for a very long time, as many people do. I went into the world. I got my college degrees. I went out into the world. I made some really ridiculous money for some period of time. I, I began to work uh, in agrarian, work with my hands, do landscaping. Went back to college and took more courses in horticulture and landscape design and um, guitar and Kobo programming and about anything I could do to get away from God. I did not want to become a pastor, and yet God pursued me. And um, finally, I said, here I am, send me. Um, which we could talk about that for another half hour, but this giving up of oneself to begin to move into the direction that God is calling someone is a very difficult time. And for most everybody, you know, this past week I had to ask some folks to step up and be Sunday school teachers for us to, to work with the children. And um, one person had some great trepidation about me asking another one of the people. And yet as soon as I mentioned it, they were absolutely thrilled. Why? Because it's their calling. Because they'd always given in to that calling and because it was simply going to be uh, an affirmation that that this is what they're to do, that I came and had a talk with them, and they're ready and, and geared up and ready to move into that position for this Sunday. Fantastic. We've got some other folks that um, who will be working with the children, too. They, they have this calling. They just simply need to be asked to move back into it and to, to pick it up and roll. I want to say to you that making, um, making a faith statement is important. Making a faith statement is important. Um, some of our brothers and sisters in the faith indicate that that's really all there is to it, that we simply need to uh, say who we understand Jesus to be, you know, to mention the name of Jesus, and, and this, is, this is all there is. Uh, however, being a United Methodist, I don't believe that that's so. It's not all there is. Um, not only that, I've come to know that what faith statement we may make at the beginning has to, in some way, um, become activated. The faith statement and the activation of the faith in ministry often are separated. Seldom are they congruent in time. The faith statement and the action that's called forth by that faith statement oftentimes are separated. Sometimes, I made phone calls again this week to talk to people about this. One person said that the separation for them was over 30 years. Another person said that it was 35 years. That the separation between making a faith statement, becoming a believer, become stepping forth to the church. I began to talk with one of my people this week and I said to them, you know, um, well, this is also kind of my understanding uh, about baptism. Um, I have a two-tier philosophy about baptism. I believe that we receive the Spirit of God upon being baptized internally. We receive the Spirit of God. Prior to that, it works externally. And after we receive it, it then works externally and internally. This is why I say, have your children baptized. I mean, the worst thing that can possibly happen is that the Spirit of God will then begin to speak to them internally and externally. 
It's a terrible thing. I don't know why people would want that for their child. Well, I wanted it for mine. I still do. I want it for me. I want it for my wife. I want it for I want it for all the folks that I know. I want it for you. I want the Spirit of God to talk to you externally and internally so that God may motivate you, me, all of us to become what God needs us to become. I remind you that we're not just in this for ourselves. I, I am well aware that in the development of a faith system, the number one step is selfish. And for most people, not all people, but most people, it's to escape something, to escape hell. Though I'm not sure that's a heavy motivator anymore. It certainly was. If we drop back 100 years ago, it was a massive, massive thing uh, in the minds of people. We could take a look why, and we could talk about um, the Spanish flu, you know, whatever it was. It is for a lot of people still today a motivating factor. I was talking with the with a guy this week, and he was he was really worried about uh, his life. He's an 89 year old guy, and he, he said, "You know, I said something about well, you got another 15, 20 years." He said, "God, I hope so." You know. I started laughing, and I thought, wow. And then I talked to several other people, and as it turns out, and it always surprises me, the greatest fear that humans seem to have is that their life is going to come to an end. That, for me, is not the greatest fear that I have. In fact, I have very little concern about that whatsoever. My greatest fear is contained in a whole bunch of things. Some of them became really poignant this week. It's funny how the news wants to pick the new thing over and over that I'm to look at, that you're to look at. And, you know, we, we were looking at fires a couple weeks ago. Prior to that, we were looking at fires elsewhere. A couple weeks before that, we were looking at floods. A couple weeks before that, we were looking at Ukraine and war. A couple weeks before that, and yet, I will guarantee you that around the world, there's all this stuff all the time. But it's interesting to me that we move through these things piece by piece. And in each of these places that they take us to look, people are mainly worried about life, living, uh, stuff, things. The faith statements that we make are not just about ourselves. Even though I'm well aware that the, as I said, the first step is a selfish step. That I want to escape death. That I want to, to be protected by God. That I want to have a relationship with God. It's a very selfish, selfish step. I don't think God begrudges us about this at all. In fact, I think God, through the Gospels, if anything, encourages us. Now, having said that, once we become believers, then we have that relationship with God, and God then begins to call us to have relationships with other people. This is what I find interesting. God allows our, our self-motivating self to have a relationship with God, and as soon as that happens, God goes, look over there, look over there, look over here. You know what? I'm going to send you to take care of those. And because of the immense amount of love that we've received from God at that point, it softens who and what we are. And our ability to then begin to see these other people, not as, as a friend of mine called them this week, leeches, but as people who are in need. And we begin to be motivated to reach out and do. You know, an acid test that you can use for yourself is how motivated are you to help other people to utilize some of the power that you have in this world and to underpin other people's lives? If there's not much there, wow, then I would wonder how close you got to the burning bush, how close you got to God. Sharing faith statement 
help me to determine what my faith statement really was. This was said by a buddy of mine this week. He said, you know, it's not until I began to share my faith statement with other people that I really began to understand what my faith statement was. That's interesting. As I look at Moses and I see him walking up to the burning bush, and I hear the conversation that he has with God, with the bush, with this angel burning bush, I begin to wonder his awareness of his own inadequacies. What, what is it that standing in the light of God causes us to understand, sometimes slowly, sometimes very quickly, the inadequacies that we have? As God begins to say, I want to send you over there. One of the first things that we say is, well, I wouldn't be good at that. That's, that's not a good idea for me. That's exactly what Moses said. You know, good grief, man. You know, I'm not your man. I'm not your man. Send somebody else. Besides, if you do send me, what am I supposed to say to those people? God says, tell them I am or I is. Tell them I am sent you. <laughs> Have you ever been called by God? You ever been called by God to do, to be? You ever been called by God to give? Has God ever said, hey, open your wallet and take care of this? Or open your time and take care of that? Open your heart and take care of that? Open your mouth and say this. Has God ever done these things with you, for you, to you? Called you to these things? I say to you at least a second time. If God has not done this, then you need to be sure that you're close enough to the burning bush to hear the burning bush. It could be you've gotten just close enough to, to get a little warmth, to grab what you want and run away. The problem is, it's not going to work. You have to get close enough to the bush to be able to hear what the bush has to say. Awarenesses of our inadequacies are actually ways of God helping us to understand two things. That we're not as great as we think we are, and I think that's a good thing. And then secondly, that we are greater than we think we are because God is going to stand with us. And two is always greater than one. Our understanding of our need to be with God actually helps us and drawing us back to the burning bush and keeping us close to God. It is in our inadequacies that we know that we cannot be what we need to be that draws us back into relationship with God. And being there, God then shares with us, look at that. I need you to go there. Look at that. I need you to help there. Look at that. I need you. God needs you. God needs me. Because that God doesn't change the world. God calls people to change the world. God doesn't remove sin. God allows sin to be there and for people to choose sin or no sin, good or evil. People say to me, there is no God because there's evil. Really? So you'd rather be a robot? I'd rather not. Who are you? And God tells him his name. Who am I? And God begins to tell Moses who he is. The same thing will happen with you. Ask God, who are you? And your understanding of God will change over time. Then ask God, who am I? And as God begins to do that, you will be less than you think you are. And you will be more than you believe you could be. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, draw us to you. Draw us to hear you. Let us allow you to be is. Let us 
allow ourselves to be defined by you as being loved, as being crucial for the kingdom, the gospel, and as being those people who become the ones who reach out and touch other folks. Empower us and then take our power from us to empower others. Integrate us in a system, a web. It is so interconnected that, that it creates enormous strength, enormous power, enormous hope, love, joy, peace, through faith and grace. Jesus, thanks for your love. Thanks for this great story. Turn around and yell across the room, Hey, Moses, some folks are talking about you today and saying thank you. Jesus, tell yourself that. Thank you. Thanks for life. Thanks for the opportunity to serve. Thanks for the relationship. In your holy, holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all those who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you join me in praying silently for our sins? Hear the good news, the gospel. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. Generous God, give thanks for all you have given us. We return from it in offering for the sake of spreading love as the body of Christ. Open us, Lord, to even better ways to steward your creation under our care. Help us to aid you and bring your kingdom to the world. In the name of Christ Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. The night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He raised it, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took a cup. He raised it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, O oh Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here, O oh Lord, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church, honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord, make this be a means of grace for us, a place where we find your holy presence. Make this be for us a sign and a symbol of your sacrifice and a call for ours. You may receive your elements. Thy voice. 
into the world empowered by the Spirit of God and be people who are beguiled by burning bushes, who are drawn to them, who are called to, to take off and to become holy people in the presence of God. Help us to hear you, O Jesus. Help us to, to build your kingdom by what you send us to do. Go and do so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have a great weekend. Enjoy it. It's going to be a beautiful one. God bless you.